Hello, my name is Mason Peterson and I am a licensed clinical social worker. Today I wanted to go over the treatment for scrupulosity or moral scrupulosity. So if you're not aware of what scrupulosity is, make sure you watch some of my other videos. I talk about this many different times. Just as a recap, scrupulosity is a form of OCD involving religious or moral obsessions. Individuals are overly concerned that things that they did, thoughts that they had, may be a violation to God, may be a violation to their morals, to their value system in life. They may be wondering over and over and over again if they are sinning in some way or another. Some common obsessions that come along with scrupulosity are wondering if they've committed some type of sin, if they are behaving morally, or if they are doing things that are immoral. They worry about their purity. They worry about going to hell. They worry about not being in the presence of God. Some individuals may worry about death just because we don't know exactly what's going to be happening after this life. Some individuals may worry that their impulse control may take over and they may do something that is against their moral or value system. Just like any other OCD, there are some compulsions that individuals do. Compulsions are the things that we do just to relieve some anxiety. Some common compulsions when it comes to scrupulosity are excessive trips to confession or their bishop or some religious leader to help them feel okay about something that they feel like they did wrong. It could be something as simple as, I looked at this other woman and I'm married and I don't know if I just committed a sin because I don't know if I lusted and if I lusted that means I committed a sin. It can also go as far as, did I cheat on my spouse? I don't have the perfect memory if I did or not, but I'm attracted to that person so maybe I did. So I'm going to talk to my religious leader and see what they think about this. And a lot of times that religious leader is like, don't worry about it, you're okay, it's all right, it's all right. But the person leaves their office and their brain says, oh no, but did I tell them every detail about this? I don't, I don't know if I told them about that girl that I saw last week, but did they know how serious I was about making sure that I didn't sin? Uh, so sometimes it can take a few minutes, it can take a few hours where the brain will just start doubting again and have that person feel the urge to go back into their religious leader. They may be seeking for reassurance from friends, family, people online just to be like, hey, do you know if this is a sin? I'm going to read the scriptures a little bit more or I'm going to pay attention to what other people are doing to see, do they say these kind of words? Do they do these type of things? Do they look at these type of people? Another compulsion is just avoidance. Individuals will avoid certain things because they may be worried that it will trigger this scrupulosity, whether it's certain colors, certain numbers, even just going to church all together. Obviously, a really big one is just praying. Some individuals may pray multiple times a day, sometimes hundreds of times a day. But you didn't come here to learn about scrupulosity. You came here for the treatment. So let's do that right now. So as you may know, the treatment for scrupulosity is exposure and response prevention. And really what this means is that we are going to take the perceived threat that you have in your head, that you did something incorrect, wrong, immoral, whatever it might be. Your brain attached some type of meaning to it that said, if you did this thing, you were going to hell or that you disappointed God and you're going to want to do a compulsion. And instead of doing that compulsion, we are going to do something different. We are going to say, I don't know if I sinned. I may or may not have sinned. Or we can completely agree with the thought and say, cool, man, I totally sinned. This is great. Essentially, what we want to do is either take a thought or take an action that you do. And we just want to do it on purpose. I know I sound crazy. I know I sound crazy, but we want to do it on purpose. So an example may be if I'm sitting here at my desk and I look over and I see Sally over there and all of a sudden my brain says, oh no, you just lusted after her. I can't believe you did that. That instead of like shielding my eyes, doing the compulsions, praying, making sure, mental reviewing to make sure that I did not do that, that I actually am going to look over at Sally again. And I'm gonna look at Sally. And I'm gonna keep looking at Sally and I'm gonna keep looking, keep looking, keep looking. And I'm gonna pay attention to what my brain says. It says, you are in danger. You better make sure you're okay. God is disappointed in you. And I'm gonna take those threats. I'm either going to leave them uncertain on purpose. I'm facing my fears. I'm facing the unknown to say, I am not going to figure out if looking at Sally means I lusted or not. I'm going to feel the anxiety. 
the anxiety is gonna rise, 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 rise. And I'm gonna say right now my anxiety is maybe like an eight out of 10, 10 being the highest. So I'm gonna keep looking at Sally and I'm gonna say, you know what? I may or may not be lusting right now. I may or may not be sinning. I don't know, we'll see. We'll find out after this life. I may or may not know for sure, but I'm gonna keep looking over at her until I can see that anxiety start to drop. And the anxiety drops and it drops and it drops and hopefully it goes down by half. But we don't always just focus on the anxiety to know that you did an exposure. What really is important is that you are teaching your brain to do something different. It says you're in danger. You didn't run from the fire that wasn't really a fire. The anxiety went down and your brain learned something. It said, hey, I told you you're in danger. You looked at it anyway and your anxiety went down. Why are you okay? So I find that those signals that get sent to your brain that say you are in danger and you better make sure you're all right, start slowing down because you didn't even give it any power, any value, any of that. You stop trying to figure it out. Where I usually have individuals start is I say, pay attention throughout the week. All of the intrusive thoughts that you have, all of the perceived threats that you have, and all of the compulsions that you do. Keep track of them. I know sometimes writing them down is not the funnest thing in the world, but somehow keep track of them. Sometimes I have loved ones or friends do this for them as well, because other people can notice different things that their loved one may do. They may say, you know what? You're praying a lot. Did you know that you're praying a lot? So I'm gonna write that down for you. Or did you know that you've asked for reassurance six times today? I'm gonna write that down for you. Families, family involvement is super important in this. At the end of the week or two, you take all the things that you found yourself avoiding, all the perceived threats that you had, and we are gonna rank them. We're gonna say zero to 10. If you were to do this on purpose, where would your anxiety be? And so you rank it the best that you can. I know it's gonna be difficult to do, but you'd say, you know, if I looked at Sally, that's gonna be like an eight out of 10. And if I touch this coffee bean, that's gonna be like a three out of 10. So ultimately what we wanna do is we're creating a hierarchy. This is a gradual, we're moving up kind of a hierarchy and it's gonna be, we're starting with exposures that are small and we're gonna build and build and build and build. So when we are looking for gradual exposures, I'm gonna give you an example of what a hierarchy might look like. Let's say that somebody named Jimmy has thoughts that he deems as blasphemous. He also worries about being dishonest. The ultimate fear is that God is going to be disappointed in him and that he may end up in hell someday. So I had Jimmy track throughout the week all the things we just talked about. He ranked all of them. And this is maybe what we came up with. I'm sending Jimmy over to a grocery store and we're gonna say, you know what? You need to go grab a sample off that plate and eat it. Maybe walk around for a little bit, come back, take another sample, walk around for a little bit, come back, take another sample. And your brain might be saying, you're being dishonest. You're supposed to be just pay, taking one sample. And he's saying, you know what? I'm probably being dishonest. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know, never know for sure after, until we'll find out after this life. That we're taking these threats, these perceived threats, and we're saying, I don't know, we'll see. Unless someone screams to my face, you're being dishonest. We're not gonna do anything different. It's gonna feel a little bit awkward. It's gonna feel like you have lots of anxiety. But like I said before, that anxiety is gonna go up and then it's gonna go down. And your brain's gonna learn that there's a difference between taking more than one sample at a grocery store and doing something like taking a candy bar from the store and putting it in your pocket and walking out. Do you think you can tell the difference? We're gonna repeat this over and over and over, maybe day after day after day until that person can take that sample and they realize their anxiety is really not as high as it used to be. So let's move on to the next one. We may play two truths and a lie. Find somebody you're gonna do that with. Two truths and a lie. So you're gonna tell two truths and one lie. But sometimes I like to mix it up and say, actually, we're gonna do two lies and a lie, but they don't know that. You're actually telling three white lies. And I know people are like, but you can't lie. God told us not to lie. I can't believe you tell me to lie, but guess what? You gotta kinda choose what you're gonna do and what you're not gonna do. So when we say white lie, we may say, I was born with brown eyes and my eyes turned blue later on in life. Not true. And we may just keep playing this and the brain might be saying, you're being dishonest, I can't believe you're doing this. And you're either saying, maybe, maybe not, or you're kind of agreeing with the thought and saying, yeah, maybe brother, we'll see, I don't know. We may follow this on throughout the day and say, you know, I got to work at 8.02, but I told my coworker that I got here at eight. Ooh, kind of like little white lies. 
Another step on the hierarchy is I might purposely open up my scriptures here and I'm going to pick some verses that I feel like caused some anxiety in the past. Whether it's in Revelations, whether it's somewhere else, that we're just going to pull up in that scripture and we're going to read it over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And as we're reading it, paying attention again to those perceived threats and worries and we're going to say, I don't know, we're going to leave them uncertain. We're not going to try to figure them out. And that's your goal. The goal to all this at the end of all this isn't to say, now I know I'm a good person and that God loves me and I'm going to go to heaven. That is not the goal. The goal is to retrain your brain. That is it. An example of a scripture may be Romans 12, 17. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. So if I just read that and I also just told somebody a white lie, did I just like ruin myself because that scripture says differently? I don't know. We're not going to figure it out. Another example is to pray incorrectly. However you normally pray, we are going to do it differently. If I kneel to pray, I'm going to stand to pray. If I put my head down as I pray, I'm going to make sure my head is straight up to the ceiling or to the side. I'm going to mess something up about the way I do things. I might be writing some words or some colors or whatever it is that might trigger this anxiety for me on purpose. I'm going to do it over and 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 over. We might be drawing pictures of Satan of the devil, you might be coloring it out, you might be drawing it yourself, you might be just looking it up in the Google images, see what comes up. Maybe you're drawing a picture of you and Satan high-fiving. Maybe you're holding a beer can in your hand if that's a thing that worries you. Maybe you're holding some coffee beans, whatever it might be. The whole goal is to do this thing on purpose. Teach your brain that you at the end of this are going to be okay. The signals are going to start slowing down. You're going to realize those things that bothered you in the past are not bothering you anymore. And it doesn't seem like it's going to work. But like I said, especially with scrupulosity, let's have faith that this is going to work. Faith is something we can't see just yet. You just have to believe it. You'll see it on the other side. And you think about whatever you're doing right now, how's that working for you? Is it working? Because I know as I go through this treatment for people, everything in their brain is saying, no, 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 this is crazy. Why would you tell me to do this? Why would I want to step closer to this anxiety? This does not make any sense. Stop it. But like I said, nothing else has worked. This is the gold standard treatment. It works. Doing this with a therapist is better than watching this video. Find somebody who can help you through this hierarchy because that's what really matters the most. You need to get the right hierarchy for you. You need to be the boss about it. You need to take control. You need to take your fears and step closer to it. You need to face the unknown on purpose, face the uncertainty. That is your job. Other people can't make you do it. Some individuals choose to take some medications for this. According to the IOCDF, or International OCD Foundation, they say that those who take medications can reduce 40 to 60% of symptoms. Hello? Why would I not want to do that? I also would say if that's something you're interested in, make sure you go to your prescriber to see what is going to be the best for you. Usually individuals take SSRIs and it seems like they're at a pretty high dose when it starts touching OCD. And I'm not giving any recommendations for you to say you need to take this and you should take medication. You got to make that decision on your own. So when it comes to exposure and response prevention and the treatment for scrupulosity, this is it. So let me know in the comments below. Have you ever done treatment for scrupulosity before? Have you tried exposure and response prevention? If so, let me know. Also, if you feel comfortable, tell me what kind of scrupulosity you struggle with. It's helpful to get this information out so you get it out of the darkness. I hope this video was helpful for you. If it was, let me know. Make sure you subscribe to my channel for more videos like this and also hit that little bell so you get notified whenever I post a new video. And remember that it is your job to face the unknown. So if you don't know what scrupulosity is, make sure you watch my videos. Another step on the hierarchy might be, I might pick... An example of a scripture might be Romans... Another an example, another an example? Huh, okay. However you normally play, 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 play.